sure I didn't say June chapter 1, but uh, book of Jude. Book of Jude, and we will just read verse number 1. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. And let's go to the Lord of prayer. Father, thank you for everything that you do for us. We thank you for the blessings of this Lord today. We ask, Father, that you would uh, protect us and, and bless this church. Lord, we, we thank you for your institution of the church and what it does for us and what a blessing it is to be a part of the church. We thank you, Lord, for the, the blessings that are promised to those people who faithfully, faithfully endure and serve you in your house. We just pray that you would help us to better serve you and to be lights to this community. Pray bless each one here tonight and that you would give us the message that we stand in need of. Lord, that you know better than we do what we need. And, and we trust in the sovereignty of, of your will and your majesty that you would provide to us what we need um, to hear. And that you work effectually in our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jude 1, Jude the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. And I've entitled this message, uh, Who I Am. Who I Am. Um, Jude is a mere 25 verses long. If my count is right, it was 608 words. This short little letter is a quarter of the size of Psalm 119. So some of the songs that they sang in the Old Testament days and in the church um, you know, it, you could read Jude four times by the time you got to the end of that one song. And this is kind of like the saying, dynamite comes in small packages. Well, such is Jude. We don't mistake the size of the epistle for its power. Um, a friend of mine one time taught Sunday school, and he told me that his class was going to read the Bible together through the year. And whenever you read a certain book, you mark that off the chart they had on the wall. It had a poster with everybody's name on it with all the verses books of the Bible. And when you read it, you marked it off. He said after about four months, he said the only ones that were marked off were Philemon, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and Titus. <laughs> they just went to the small ones and he said they just kind of ended off after that. But don't let the size of the book fool you. There's a lot in this little book. Um, even though it's small, there, there's really only one theme to it. And the book is deep and you can get a whole lot out of this epistle. And I just want to look at the salutation this morning, or this evening, and just look at the, the depth of just his introduction. And I'm just going to preach on the first half of that first sentence. The Jude, the servant of Christ, and the brother of James. In this salutation, Jude tells us who he is, and the title of the, and gives us where I got the title of the message, Who I Am. Um, this salutation, the epistle of Jude, gives us insight to who we are as Christians. This is a question that people ask all the time. Say, who am I? And they think about, of course, their identity. People think a lot about themselves now and the type of personality that they have and, and their identity and who they are. And, and, you know, that people will put a lot into their work and they'll make their work their identity. And, and if they don't have a job that is a blessing to their identity, they don't feel like they are um, complete as a person. Well, Jude tells us who he is as a person. And what it is that makes Jude, Jude. And I think this can be instructive for us as we know, as we see what it is that makes us as Christians and gives us our identity. Jude tells us who he is. And then, so let's look at it. who was Jude. Well, it says first, Jude was the brother of James. And I believe that Jude was the Lord's half brother. Yeah. And, you know, I, I wouldn't fight anybody over, but that's what I believe. The, um, the problem with figuring this out, though, is there's so many James and Judes in the Bible. Um, there's uh, Jude is the same as Judas. So you have Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed the Lord. You have Judas Thaddeus, Acts 5.37. You have Judas of Galilee. In Acts 9, you have Judas of Straight Street. And you have Judas Barsabbas, who went to Antioch with Paul. And you have the Lord's half-brother, Jude. Well, it says... Jude, not only do you have that problem, that there's six different Judes in the New Testament, 
There's three different James. You have James, the brother of John, James, the son of Alphaeus, and you have James, the Lord's half-brother. So if you take all the Judes in the Bible, or Judases, and you take all the James, Jameses in the Bible, there's only one set of brothers named James and Jude, and that's the Lord's half-brothers. Um, you find that in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 55. Where they said, it says this, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. So there you have it. There's uh, James and Judas, or Jude. So that's the only two, uh, two James and uh, James and the Jude that are brothers. So he said, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and the brother of James. And you can study that out some more in especially in the book of Acts and um, the book of Luke, to where you see that, um, that there's only one set of brothers, that's uh, James and Jude. Well, why is this important? Um, I think that if he had been an apostle, he would have made that distinction, because Peter and Paul, they'll say, Peter, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and they, they tell you who they are. And, and Paul makes a big point that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ and thus has the authority to speak as an apostle. Um, James told us who he was by saying, I'm, J I'm Jude, James' brother. So whoever he was writing to, that was enough for them to understand who this was. If he had said, I'm Jude, the apostle, not Iscariot, like uh, John said, then everybody would have known who he was. So whoever he was writing to knew that this was uh, James' brother. And, you know, I believe James is, uh, I, I believe he was the pastor there at Jerusalem, not the apostle, James anyway. So while he, by, while he was saying this, he was letting everybody know who he was. He was James' brother. So why do we care? Though we can't say 100% for certain, I, even though I do believe it, we know that it was secondary to how he identified himself. But there was nothing in the flesh attributed uh, to his position with God. Now imagine that he grew up in the same home as our Lord Jesus. I know that people don't like to think about that. They, they call Mary the perpetual virgin, but the, the Bible is very clear that her and Joseph had children after Jesus was born. Amen. Uh, she was a virgin when he was conceived in the womb, but uh, by the Holy Spirit, but James or Mary and Joseph had lots of other children. They had two girls too, it says. So, um, imagine that, that he was the half-brother of Jesus, that Jesus was the perfect Son of God, and while he was in the flesh, and while he grew in, in stature and wisdom with men, he was still perfect. He never committed any sin. So while Jude and James and Simon were out causing trouble, Jesus never did. And while... Uh, Judas and James wouldn't clean their room like Mary taught them to. Jesus always did. And while James and Joseph wouldn't uh, do their chores, Jesus always did. He was the perfect son. And there it says that even during our Lord's ministry, that his brethren didn't believe and follow after him. So he grew up living day by day, side by side with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he didn't say Jude, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he said, Jude, the brother of James. I think that's kind of instructive in the fact that, that there was no prophet in the flesh. There was no prophet for him growing up in the same household of the Lord. Now, we don't know, um, you know, what about Jesus' neighbors? What about the people that lived close to him and saw him every day? Well, um, we know that the, the town there, they didn't hear him because he had no honor in his own place. He got up and left because they said, well, this is the carpenter's son. This is, not, is his mother not Mary and his brother James? You know, yeah. that, that's what they were saying. Why do we have to listen to him? We, we've seen him since he was a little kid. They had no re respect for him because they thought that they um, were superior to him. Amen. There's no prophet in the flesh, whether by law or by relation. By growing up in church, there was no profit for Jude, having been so close in the flesh to the Lord Jesus. Um, until the Lord truly saved him, until he repented of his sins and trusted in Christ, there was no profit. In fact, there was only more condemnation. 
Could you imagine the, the damnation, the judgment that would come upon a person that lived in the same house as the Lord Jesus and yet would not believe? So there was no prophet to him. He was an unbeliever until after the resurrection. As Jesus preached, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, he probably mocked and rolled his eyes and just said, you know, that's always, he, you know, he's always had uh, been mother's favorite. And maybe like um, the, the children of Israel was, they looked towards Joseph with a jealousy and a hatred because they had the father's love. Yes. Um, so there, there was no prophet, in fact, probably more condemnation. But after the resurrection, he believed and put his trust in Christ. So Jude said that he was first, you know, he was the brother. So if he was going to identify himself, he'd say, I'm James's brother. But what did he mention first? Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. The servant of Jesus Christ. Not the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Or not one that's known Jesus longer than anybody else that was following him, because he did, I guess, if he was his brother. But what did he say? He said, I'm the servant of Jesus. So Jude's identity was not wrapped up in who his family was. It was in who he was in Christ. His identity as a human being was that he was a servant of Christ. Or if you take it at the other view and say, well, I don't believe that he was. I believe he was the apostle. Well, then he didn't take his um, identity in, in being an apostle. He was one that was humble before God. And somebody asked him who he was. He said, I'm a servant of Christ. He didn't say, well, I, who are you, you know, what do you do? Well, I'm a, I'm a tent builder or I'm a tent maker or something like that. You ask Paul what he was, and he said, oh, I'm a, a servant of Christ. I'm an apostle unto the Lord. His identity wasn't built up in what he did, but who he was in Christ. And that's something that uh, we can glean from. Because you know, a lot of the Christians in the New Testament were servants. They were slaves. They were indentured servants to other men. And, and God tells them that who they were in Christ. Now you may be a servant, but he says that you're in the family of God. You're the sons of God. So his identity was one of a servant of Christ. He would, he would humble himself to acknowledge that he, he, though he grew up in the flesh seeing Jesus, um, he, had, he identified himself as first and foremost a sinner saved by grace. So Jude was the half-brother of James, but Jude was a servant. He was a, a, a doulos, a, a bond servant, one who was subjected to the authority of another person, as the dictionary tells us, one who was, whose person and liberty are restrained. It's not the idea of a butler, but, but a slave. People try to tell us, well, a servant is somebody that, that lives in the house and it's not as bad as a slave. No, this, this Greek word means a slave. He was a slave. He was a slave to Christ. And that kind of rubs us the wrong way, especially as Americans. You know, we, nobody's going to tell us what to do. We're, we're free men. We, we have liberty. And you look, at, you look at slavery in our day, and it automatically brings up uh, bad ideas of, of men stealers. Well, the Bible forbade uh, the slavery that we had in these United States. The Bible said that that was wrong in um, 1 Timothy um, chapter number 1, verse number 10. It says, For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. And, and that's what happened with the slavery in our country. There were men-stealers. They go and kidnap men and women and children from their families and, and, and sell them. Um, that was not the, the way of slavery as you read in the Old Testament and the way of slavery that was understood during these times they, they didn't go, and they weren't men stealers most of the time men were either conquered by a, a, a defeating army and they took them in or they put themselves into to service but they, they sold themselves into that slavery because they couldn't pay debt or they didn't have any money, they didn't have a place to live and it was better off for them so you know, when you read slavery, we automatically think of, you know, slavery in the South, but, but that's not what we're talking about here. You know, your liberty is restrained, but it's not necessarily being a, man, being a men stealer. Because we were born in this uh, slavery. You and I, were, we were born in the slavery. People say, well, I'm a free man. I, I'm born in America. I'll, I'll, 
wave the American flag and nobody's going to tell me what to do, I'm free. No, we are servants. We are born servants. In Romans chapter number 6, in verse 16, it says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after a manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for you have yielded your members servants to uncleanliness, and to iniquity, unto iniquity. Even so now yield your members servants to righteousness, unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you in those things whereof you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become the servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness in the end of everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if you were without Christ, you were not free. So I don't want to be a Christian. Then I'll be tied down to where I have to go to church and I have to do all these things. Well, God changes your heart to where you desire to do those things which He calls you to do, first of all. But second of all, you're not free now. The lost have no free freedom of the will. They say, I, I have a free will. I can do what I want. Well, you have the free will in the sense that you will do what your nature desires to do, but you're a slave to your nature. Amen. Amen. What you will do is what you want to do, and what you want to do is sin. You are a servant of sin. That's right. The famous example would be if I took the song book and dropped it from the, the pulpit here, that book has the freedom once I let it go to do whatever it wants to. But what's it going to do? It's going to fall. It has the freedom. No one, nothing's restraining it except itself, but it's going to fall to the ground because that's what the gravity is going to pull it out. A sinner has the free will in the sense that God will um, give them, you know, if God let a man do whatever he wants. What he will do is sin. And when, in Romans chapter 1, that's what it tells us, that as punishment, God will give men over to their own reprobate hearts. Amen. That God is gracious to sinners and that he will not allow them to go as deep into sin as they would want to. Amen. See, if you're without Christ, you are a slave. You have no freedom. Sin rules your heart. Sin rules your affection. Sin controls your life. You are in bondage. Your will is in bondage. Your heart is in bondage. Your soul is in bondage. You are a slave to sin. You are a servant of iniquity, is what it says in verse 19. And the, and the slave wages is death. You are a servant to iniquity. You are out in the field, and you are, you are laboring and laboring with the cruel taskmaster Satan standing over top of you when you were chained. You were chained in your sins. And you're free to do whatever you want as long as, you're, as long as that chain will let you go. But you are serving sin. And you are serving, you're working and sweating sin. And the wages of sin is death. That's what your slave master will pay you at the end of your life. Amen. Live it up. Have all the freedom you want attached to that chain. Because your wages at the end of the day is death. But Christ has come. And Christ has come and has freed us from that old master. Amen. He has unlocked the chains. He has freed us from the, way, the, the, the slavery of sin and iniquity. And he has set us free from our old master. In verse 18, then being made free from sin. Christ came and made us free from sin. Free from the, the bondage of sin. Or free from the power of sin. And free from the sin, the hold that sin once had on our hearts. And where we once yielded to sin, we now yield to righteousness. In verse 19, for where sin would come before us, and we would God go headfirst into it. We yielded to it. That's what we desired. But now we yield towards righteousness. Our new master had come and paid our debt. We were freed. We have been freed and delivered from the old master. Now we're owned by the new master, the Lord Jesus. And we have the fruits of our new master. Verse 
22. We've been made free from sin and become the servants to God. That, that Christ bought us with his own blood. He paid for us. And our bodies belong to him. Our souls belong to him. Amen. Now, we don't have slave wages anymore. The slave wages, the wages of sin is death. We don't have those wages anymore. But now we have slave gifts. That's what he gives us. But the gift of God is eternal life. Look at that in verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. The wages of the old slave master is death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We no longer have the wages of what we um, wrought from our old ways, but we now we have the gift of life. You have the wages of death, what you owe, what you were owed is death, but now you have the gift of life. Servants of sin and servants of Satan yield death. Servants of Christ have life. We are servants of the Lord God and have it much, much better. The slave of sin gets his wages, but the slave of Christ gets his life. Not what he earns or what he deserves, but what the master is pleased to give. Because we are not our own person anymore. We were bought. Look with me in 1 Corinthians. Chapter number 6. You know, we're not our own person anymore. Amen. A servant isn't his own person. A servant goes where his master tells him to go and says what his master tells him to, tells him to say. 1 Corinthians 6.13 Meats for the belly and belly for meats, but God shall destroy both of them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And then verse number 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? And you, and ye are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Amen. Your body belongs to God. Your soul belongs to God. He paid for you. Amen. He bought you. And you're going to take your body and take it someplace where you ought not to take it and Display it in ways you ought not to display it. And, and live in ways to which your master who paid for you has not willed for you to do. See, the master decides where the, the servant goes. And the master decides where he, what he says and where he, what he wears and where he goes. If the master says, don't do that, it doesn't matter what the slave wants to do. We are owned by God. He, he, we... It, our life it belongs to Him. We were bought with the price. Yes. You know, we were slaves to sin. We walked in bondage to the flesh and the devil. And we were set free from that awful bondage that leads to death. But we were purchased by Christ. We didn't voluntarily sign up for it. And we weren't born into the family. We were purchased. We were redeemed. It's not that God owed anything to us. That He went out and he took a bunch of worthless rebels who were getting what they deserved. And God would have been just to leave us there. But he went and he had mercy. He just came to me and set me free from the, the bondage of sin. Amen. I don't know why he did that, but he did. He just came and he set me free for his own glory. And he, he redeemed me. He said, all right, now you're my slave. Now you come with me, and you follow me. And I'm going to put a yoke on you, but my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And you come and follow me, and, and you are mine. You belong to me now. I wasn't redeemed from our old slave owner, but, and I don't want you to take the example too far, that Jesus didn't buy us from the devil, and that's not what, I, what the, the illustration is, is saying here. But the purchase was made to the Father. Um, in the slave trade, slave, trade, uh, slave trade days, the value was put on the worth of the, the slave. So if you had somebody that was a slave that was 25 years, a 25-year-old man that was just as strong as anybody, he's going to be more valuable than um, you know, a 70-year-old man, if you could even sell a 70-year-old slave. The weaker, the older, the sicklier, were the less valuable. 
So, um, you know, the, the stronger they were physically, the more value that they made. But the, the payment of Christ was made according to our worthlessness. You know, it was quite the opposite. We had nothing in value to offer. We had nothing in us to make us valuable. We're not even valuable now. In Luke chapter number 17, you know, this, should, this should humble all people that, that feel that the Lord was so um, lucky to, to get us. In Luke chapter 17 and verse number 10. Well, let's start verse number 7. There's a parable. It says, But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him, By and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meat? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward thou shalt eat. He said, So if you have a servant, you're not going to come and you're not going to fix him food, but you're going to expect when he's done with that for him to come and make your supper. Does he think that the servant, because he did these things that were commanded him, I trow not? So likewise, ye, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, Commanded you say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Amen. That if we spend our time and, and you know, we, it, it's easy, we can say, well, I go to church and I read my Bible. I'm a profitable servant. No, you're just doing what God told you to do. Amen. We are not profitable. We are unprofitable because we don't even do that. See, there's nothing in us that adds to God. Even when we do what we're told, we're just doing what we're told. We were purchased for, we were purchased. Our sins were paid for. We owed a great sin debt, one which we never ever could pay. And the debt was to the just and holy God. So Jesus didn't buy us from the slave master. He paid our sin debt. The, de the, the wages of sin is death, and Jesus paid those wages. Jesus, as our substitute, took our debt and took our place. And he freed us from sin. He saved us from our sins. Now that's something that people say, well, he'll save you and send you to heaven. But the Bible says he saves us from our sins. He frees us. He buys us. He redeems us. And we belong to him. Amen. And though we might desire sin, still in our hearts, we, we, might, we still desire um, sin. We are the slaves of God. We, we belong to Him. That we may desire, but God reminds us that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That we may desire to sin, but then we are reminded that we were bought with a price. And then we are not going to go and do something wicked because our Lord bought us. The choice is not up to us. God owns us. Body, mind, and soul. We belong to Him. In Romans chapter 14, verses 7 and 8, and also illustrates the same thing. Romans 14, verse number 7, says, For none of us liveth to himself, no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. In our life, in our death, we are God's. Amen. We are God's in our life. We, are, we belong to God in our death. We belong to Jesus. And some might object and say, well, I don't like being called a servant. I don't like the idea. Well, the more I think about it, the more I ponder it, I wouldn't have it any other way. I wouldn't have it any other way than to be the slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jude had a love for our Lord. When we think of slaves or servants, we think of somebody without a will, without hope, trapped against his will, in an insufferable uh, situation. But Jude wasn't complaining. Jude rejoiced, was rejoicing. He said, this is who I am. This is my identity. And um, there's an illustration of that in the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 21. This is how slavery worked in, in these times. <coughs> um, Exodus chapter 21. Now, these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. 
If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years shall he serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. And if he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master hath given him a wife, and she hath borne him sons and daughters, the wife and the children shall be uh, her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go free. I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Now, I remember as a boy, um, a preacher saying, you don't want to be a slave, you don't want to get your ear pierced, because that makes you a slave, and you don't want to be a slave. But you think about this picture here. You know, some people had to sell themselves because of their poverty. And you can certainly understand that. How many of us have had to take jobs that we didn't want to take and get trapped in, in dead-end jobs for a long time because we didn't have any other choice? Well, this is what this was like. Well, if a man's crops failed and his cattle died and there he had and looks around and maybe he's got a family and, and uh, he can't feed his children, what's he going to do? <coughs> he goes to one of his brethren who's, who's rich and says, no, I'm going to sell myself into your service for, for six years. And then that way he can live with the guy and work for him and he can have be provided for him and his family won't start him yet. Well, every seven years God commanded the doll of slave to go free. Slavery in God's economy was a temporary situation. Well, imagine this guy goes in and he just has the best master that's ever lived. That the master not only... Uh, a left gave him a place to live, but it was better than the one that he had before. And, and maybe this guy wasn't married at the time, and he gets a wife, and he falls in love with this wife, and he has kids, and he loves his kids. He loves his master. He loves what his master has him to do. He, he loves um, the gifts that his master gives him, and just everything about it is just wonderful. Their life was bad before. But his master's so good now, he doesn't want to give it up. He loves his wife too much and his children too much. And, and the benefits were so good that, that they, wouldn't, they couldn't get rid of him if he wanted to. And he says, all right, your six years is up. And he said, no, I don't want to go. I will not go free. I love my master. I will no, not go out free. Well, they take his ear to the side of the door and they, they put a hole in it. And that was a sign to everybody that he was a slave forever. And I feel like that way with the Lord Jesus. That the Lord purchased me. And the Lord saved me. And he has such a wonderful service. And such a wonderful family. And such wonderful benefits. That I wouldn't trade being the Lord's servant to be set out of my own free will. Amen. If it were possible that the Lord could say, all right, you're free. I believe that I would say I will not go out free. I love my master. I love my Lord. Yeah. Psalm 116.1 says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice. And verse 5 says, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. And I think that's what uh, the true child of God says. That it's not his, his commandments are not grievous to us. Because we love him. Our hearts have been changed. And we love our service to God. We love our master, and we will not go free. I want to please God. I want to do what is right in God's eyes. If Paul wanted to please men, how could he be the servant of Christ too, is what he asked. He said, I can't serve two masters if I just want to be a man pleaser. And you know, Paul told them, uh, he said, I couldn't come in here and be your servant and please you and please God at the same time. Amen. No, I can't stand behind the pulpit and do everything I can to please everybody here in the sense of, of, of preaching what people want to hear instead of what the Word of God says. I can't please men and please God too. Yeah. So if I'm the servant of Christ and I love my Master, I'm going to please my Master. Yeah. Amen. Paul loved Jesus. And not only was Paul duty bound, but he has hearts and desires to please. You know, people will say, well, that law uh, for the Christian, if, if you say that a Christian has to do something, a Christian has to obey, you're putting the law on it. The Christian desires to please the Lord. And when God tells us to do something, it should be our heart's desire to do that. 
Not because we have to, because I love my master right now, I will not go out free. Jude loved the Lord because the Lord first loved him. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. <clears throat> For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And he that died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. It's not merely Jude's love for Christ that kept him as a servant. And it's not merely my love for Christ that keeps me as a servant. Because, you know, I kind of struggle there to say if the Lord would say, you can go free, I will go free. Because I don't trust my own heart. That Christ would never do that to us. Christ redeems us and bores our uh, ear hole um, immediately. And then he gives us a new heart to say, I don't want to go free. Because he does constrain us. But how does he do it? For the love of Christ constraineth us. The love of Christ binds us. Slaves were chained and shackled against their will, sometimes in this country, anyway, with irons and whips, and slaves to sin are constrained by their wicked hearts and their pleasure. But how are we constrained? How are we bonded as the slaves of Christ? We are constrained by love. The bonds of sin have been broken, and we've been set free. We are Christ's free men, yet we are constrained. We are shackled with the cords of love. That's what it says in Hosea 11, 4. I drew them with the cords of a man, with bands of love, and I was to them as they take off the yoke of their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. God drew <coughs> us and arrested us with irresistible grace, with the cords of love. And he strains us and constrains us by his love. We were drawn to Christ by the Holy Spirit. We could not resist God's sovereign, effectual call. But I didn't want to resist God's sovereign and effectual call. I know that from the word of God that, that the Holy Spirit quickened me and drew me unto him and constrained me with cords of love. But when the Lord saved me, I didn't know any of that. All I knew was I saw Jesus and I loved Jesus. And I followed Jesus and I wanted him to save me. And I was constrained by his love. And after you read the Bible, you say, oh, well, that's how that happened. I didn't know that. I didn't know that's how that happened. But we are constrained by the love of God. The love of Christ, that he died for us. And how can we go off to ourselves for all that he did for us? How can we live for ourselves with all that he's promised? How can we forsake the Lord's house and the Lord's work and the Lord's ways with all that he's done for us and all that he's saved us from and all that he's given us and all these promises that the Lord Jesus Christ has bestowed us with and blessed us with? How can we walk away? We are constrained by the love of Christ. And, and He changes our hearts to where we don't want to go, even if we could. Man. But we don't want to go because He constrained us. He changed our hearts to where we don't want to go. And that's even all of God. So as we wrap this up, who was Jude? Well, Jude was who Christ made him. That's who Jude was. Man. Jude was identified for what, by what Christ gave him. Let's look at one more verse here in Galatians 2, verse 20. <coughs> I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm not my own. My life, uh, it's not my life, it's Christ in me. My life is lived by faith. I am a Christian. I'm a Christian not because I'm not a Muslim, and I'm a Christian not because I'm not a Jew. Because I am in Christ. My union with Christ makes me uh, a Christian. I live in Christ and I live for Christ. I live for the one who loved and died for me. So how do we identify ourselves? By our music, by our hobbies, by our work? 
people can identify themselves and say, you know, I'm, I'm a, people, you know, what do you like to do for fun? Well, I like to play sports. What are you going to do whenever you can't play sports anymore? Uh, who, what do you do? Well, I like to play music. What are you going to do if you can't play music anymore? Or they identify themselves with their job. What are you going to do if you can't work anymore? And what, if, what are you when you, all, when you take it all away? What if you're left with Job and you don't have a family, you don't have a house, you don't have anything, and all, you, all left is you? Then what would you be? It wasn't Peter a fisherman. Peter didn't write that. Peter a fisherman. Or Paul a tent maker. Our identity is not wrapped up in the things that we do or the things that we like, but it's wrapped up in Christ. That's who Jude was. He was a servant of Christ, and that's who I am. I don't consider myself Doug Mould, the shipping and receiving person. That's not my identity. I do that in order to provide uh, for my family. Who am I? I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. That's who I, how I view myself. When I'm in Jesus Christ, that's my identity. It's not that I'm Doug Mould the American or Doug Mould this or that. I am in Christ. That's my identity, and that's where I find my satisfaction. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Is what, the, is what it says in 1 Corinthians 15. Who are you? Well, if you were in Christ, um, you were His servant. You, know, you don't have to be somebody else. I have the personality that God gave me, and I don't try to act like somebody else. Because I was knit in the, my mother's womb. I have the voice that God gave me, whether I like that voice or not, and the mind that God gave me, whether I like it or not. God knit me together and made me the person I am and tuned me for an instrument to His glory. And I don't find my identity in what I look like or, or my stature or my physical strength, because that's all going to go away. <coughs> My identity is in Christ. I am a child of God. I am, by God's grace, a servant of Christ. We know who Jude is. Um, who are you? Well, let's stand and be dismissed and worship.